Welcome to our Save Democracy and the Planet Meetup. I'm Fabrice Florin, Director of Green Change, our Bay Area Climate Action Network. We're honored that so many of you are joining us for this community meetup about political action from all over Marin, the Bay Area, and beyond. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers who will tell us about the many ways we can protect democracy and our planet. We will introduce them in a moment, and we thank them for their time, as well as the organizations who support their work. We're also honored to partner with Time to Lead on Climate co-chairs Bill Cole and Bill Carney, who will be our co-hosts for this Community Action Meetup. Bill Cole is chair of OFA Marin and co-chair of Time to Lead on Climate. She is on the board of the Marin Conservation League. She leads the Marin Biomass Project as well as the Ecologically Sound Practices Partnership for Wildfire Prevention. Bill Carney is president of Sustainable San Rafael, co-chair of Time to Lead on Climate, and secretary of Marin Can, which targets greenhouse gas emissions below net zero by 2045. Their organization, Time to Lead on Climate, represents a dozen local climate action groups who are also doing wonderful work to reduce global warming in our area. And we're grateful to the Green Change team for making this event possible and to all the Green Change partners uh -uh. who graciously support our work. Okay. Here's our agenda for tonight's meetup. We will feature four talks okay. on a wide range of topics and have a Q&A at the end of the hour followed by green, green. tips from our community. Our Zoom rules for this meetup are simple. Please mute your microphone and ask questions for our speakers in text chat. We will uh, invite you to be courteous with all participants in this community event. We're recording this Zoom meeting on video. We'll email you the video, the slides, and the text chat links in a few days. To see captions for this meeting, you can also turn on live transcript at the bottom of your screen. If this is your first time at a Green Change event, welcome. We're a climate action network of concerned citizens like you who help each other live sustainably and build a better world. We serve a growing community of thousands of members in the San Francisco Bay Area, California, and beyond. Each year, we organize four quarterly campaigns along with our partners. This year, we hosted campaigns on regeneration, Earth 2050, Electrify Everything, and this campaign save democracy in the planet. Each of our campaigns kicks off with a public event like this one. And we also create online content, including action guides and community tips on a wide range of climate and political actions, which you can find at the link that we just posted in text chat. We invite you to take action with us. Tonight's theme is save democracy and the planet. As our planet burns, democracy is now under attack, blocking climate action and social change. We face multiple crises that now threaten our lives, a climate crisis, a health crisis, an economic crisis, but the most concerning is our political crisis caused by a surge of issues such as blind faith, conspiracy theories, fake news, culture wars, insurrections, voter suppression, and civic apathy. And did you know that half of Americans don't vote? This is really disturbing. So how can we turn this around to save democracy and our planet? Take political action. In this time of crisis, we invite you to go beyond individual actions such as green actions, and to also get involved in politics to protect our future in the midterm elections. Tonight, we will learn about many political actions we can take in our own lives. Plan your own vote, help people vote, join phone banks, get out to vote in person, support green leaders of your choice. We have political guides for each of these actions on our site. And in dark times like ours, action is the antidote to despair. Each of us can help change the world we live in. And we hope that tonight you'll find out how you can join your neighbors to be part of the solution to our political and climate crisis. And now we would like to introduce our speakers. 
These inspiring community leaders work at all levels of our democracy, national, state, regional, and local. Jared Hoffman, U.S. Representative, will talk about shoring up national climate progress. Ellie Cohen, Director of the Climate Center, will discuss how we can help California lead the nation beyond net zero emissions. Stephanie Moulton-Peters, Marin County Supervisor, will speak about climate action and local democracy. And Laura Nish, Director of 350 Bay Area, will tell us how we can help climate and democracy win the midterms. If you have any questions for our speakers, we invite you to write them in text chat. We will have a Q&A session after the last talk when we'll ask our speakers to answer some of your questions. To kick off our events, our co-host, Bell Cole, will introduce our keynote speaker. Um, Congressman Huffman, we're honored to have you with us. According to Nancy Pelosi, you are the go-to person in the House on climate change. This makes us proud and fortunate. Uh, Congressman Huffman represents California's second district, congressional district, which spans the north coast of the state from the Golden Gate Bridge to the Oregon border. He was first elected to Congress in November 2012 and serves on House committees on the climate crisis, natural resources, transportation, and infrastructure. We look forward to hearing about how enactment of the IRA and other environmental legislation benefit Marin and how we can translate these successes into voter turnout. Thank you for being here, uh, Congressman Huffman. Well, thank you, Bill. Appreciate that introduction. Fabrice, great to be with you and really proud to associate myself with this wonderful Green Change Network. Also honored to share the virtual stage with the other great speakers that you have lined up. They are all terrific. And uh, I really commend you for putting together a great program this evening. So I'm going to speak about the federal perspective on this climate crisis, which of course is intersecting with the democracy crisis at the same time. Uh, I'll leave enough time for questions. Um, and then sadly, I have some meetings at the White House in the morning and have to do some homework tonight. The night shift begins in just a few minutes for me, and I will not be able to hang around for the full program, but um, we'll make the most of the opening time slot I've got here. And I will, I think, begin by just giving you the punchline right up front uh, for everything I'm gonna tell you. Um, it's about the election. <laughs> so I would, I would be happy to tell you about the things that this Congress and this president have achieved by way of climate action in the past year and a half. I'm certainly happy to tell you about the unfinished business that we haven't gotten done. And I'm happy to talk about the mixed results because often some of the big wins that we've been able to get came with uh, you know, some Joe Manchin little gifts to the fossil fuel industry. So it presents an interesting package of things. We wanna make sure that we uh, get all of these good things over the finish line and uh, make sure that they are successful uh, we want to take care of the unfinished business that we weren't able to get done. And then um, for the mixed bag things, uh, we want to make sure that uh, the executive branch is working with us to limit the damage on some of those provisions and that we circle back, hopefully, in the next Congress and undo some bad stuff. Uh, so there, there's a lot going on, and uh, all of it really depends on the outcome of this election. Uh, if we win this election, it is totally possible to successfully implement the good things that we've achieved. It's totally possible to go back and fix technical errors and bad things we were forced to accept because of Joe Manchin. It's totally possible to circle back to things we couldn't pass and get them done, like the offshore drilling ban that I've authored for many years and the, the ban on drilling in the Arctic refuge. Uh, if we don't win two more seats in the Senate and hold the House, it's gonna be playing defense all the time. And so, um, look, I haven't even got to the saving democracy part of this crisis, but it's wrapped up in all of this too. Um, the next Congress is gonna be in a critical role to determine how the electoral vote is even counted. So uh, I hope you don't need any more motivation to engage in this election 52 days from now. It is all on the line, it's all at stake. And that is the punchline uh, for everything that I can tell you. now. 
In terms of what we have gotten done, there is um, definitely cause for celebration. We have achieved some big things. The bipartisan infrastructure bill, while not perfect, includes historic levels in, of investment in the kind of modern clean energy infrastructure we're going to need in a, an EV charging network nationally and locally in a number of things that are going to be critical, the foundation really to decarbonizing the economy. Uh, we've been able to appropriate uh, money to various programs at the Department of Energy, Department of Transportation, other things that are essential for um, advancing good climate action. Things like the loan guarantees of the Department of Energy, which are really powerful tools of climate action. Most recently, uh, we were able to pass the Inflation Reduction Act, which is a, a shadow of what we had hoped it would be back when we passed the Build Back Better Act. That was our work product in the House, but it's still got a lot of good stuff in it. Some really good big things survived Joe Manchin. And the best of it is um, the tax credit package that will really kind of provide the industrial policy pivot that we need to decarbonize the economy. There are now powerful new incentives in the tax code for folks to invest in clean energy and to site clean energy facilities in disadvantaged communities, which is what we want to achieve. We're tired of them bearing all the damage from fossil fuel um, impacts, and it's time for them to reap some of the benefits of clean energy. Um, there are some great consumer side tax incentives. Uh, so everything from uh, helping you decarbonize your home with tax credits for um, things like uh, solar, but also getting rid of that natural gas stove and hot water heater, maybe moving to a heat pump so that you can be fully electrified at home. Uh, you're going to find a whole bunch of things that help move us forward at the individual level and at the industrial societal level uh, in a big, big way. Uh, now, there's some things we had to accept as trade-offs uh, in this mix. Joe Manchin insisted that we do a lot of fossil fuel business as usual as a condition uh, for continued offshore wind, for example, and continued uh, solar on public lands and for these tax credits. In the bipartisan infrastructure bill, uh, there are too many incentives for things that frankly just benefit the fossil fuel industry. And I won't get too wonky about this, but uh, there are a bunch of things like carbon capture and sequestration that are really just industry tropes, uh, ways to help oil companies do enhanced oil recovery while pretending that they're engaging in climate solutions. And we're going to throw, unfortunately, billions of dollars at those things until we can circle back and you know, maybe clean up some of that. And then um, you're also going to see things like a, a huge loan guarantee for an LNG facility in Alaska and other support for some fossil infrastructure that really shouldn't be there. So on balance, I do feel like we've made huge strides forward, really important, and we, we needed to say yes to all of those things. We couldn't say no, we have to have that progress, but we have to also make sure we're not, um, we're not setting in motion a whole bunch of new fossil fuel business as usual, because that's, that's really the thing that we've got to tackle if we're gonna seriously decarbonize. Okay, so um, that's climate. Uh, that's kind of my quick take on what's going on in Washington. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. One last thing on the democracy side, the January 6th special committee is not done. I'm sure there's gonna be some must-see TV before the month of September is out, but um, they have done an amazing job at, first of all, just chronicling what the heck happened uh, in the lead up to this event and to the ex in the execution of this event, the immediate aftermath of this event, we may never have known a lot of these things if it hadn't been for this incredible work by the select committee. And I suspect we've got a few more shoes to drop, but the story of this terrible insurrection is now part of the political narrative in this election year. And that's important too, because it's one of the things at stake and it's one of the things we all need to be reminding voters about in the next 52 days. So happy to take a few questions and then I will yield to the other excellent speakers that you've got here this evening. I have a question for you. This is Bill Cole. Yeah. Um, given the staggering proportions of the climate crisis, is it likely that the significant resources 
provided by the new climate bill will result in more climate champions in Congress and the nation at large. You know, I, I hope that those resources result in action on the ground. I think that the climate champion, the political um, outcome you're, you're referring to, Bill, yeah. is already happening. We're seeing climate champions emerge, and part of that is just generational change. This younger yeah. generation gets it, and they are coming to Congress with a whole new type of focus and with a sense of impatience and urgency. So I, I am a lot less worried about that than I am about, you know, how we're going to deliver on these resources and translate them into actual uh, good outcomes, because that's going to determine whether I can come back uh, to Congress and do even more. Yeah. Thank you, Congressman. We have a couple of questions in text chat. And if you have any questions okay. for uh, uh, Jared, please type them in text chat. There's one question from Ellie Cohen. Uh, mm -hmm. Congressman Huffman, are we going to get 50 to 52 percent cuts in GHGs by 2030, as President Biden has committed to, and the world is looking to the U.S. to achieve? Thank you, Ellie, and thanks for all your leadership locally. Look, uh, after the Inflation Reduction Act, you probably heard the uh, the trumpeting of, you know, we're now on a path to get to 40 to 42 percent reduction by the end of this uh, decade. Well, a couple of things about that. First, that's a reduction from 2005 baseline. We, we were spewing a lot of carbon pollution in 2005, so no one should think that this is a mission accomplished moment, um, but it is progress. The other thing, and I, I don't want to you know, be too deflating about uh, the enthusiasm we all feel about the Inflation Reduction Act, but most of that 40 to 42 percent reduction from the 05 baseline was business as usual. It was just sort of the baked in continuation of the trend away from coal and to cleaner energy. So the Inflation Reduction Act gets you, you know, maybe another seven or eight percent, but it is not the reason that we are at 40 to 42. It is all the other things that we've been doing, the things that California is doing that have us on that trajectory. And obviously uh, the commitment is 50. So by no means mission accomplished. And I will say the Biden administration, to their credit, is, uh, you know, they haven't rested on their laurels. They're getting ready to do a bunch of rulemaking at the EPA. They're pushing out the 30 by 30 policy and a whole bunch of other things. So we are not done. We're going to keep doing more. And I, I'm hopeful that we will hit 50. Heck, I'm hopeful that we'll go way beyond it. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, we have another uh, question from Barry Chertov in the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that there's any hope for a carbon tax? Uh, is it politically viable or are subsidies the only viable path? So right now, a carbon tax is not politically viable, but uh, you got to keep pushing for the tools that we know can make a big difference. So the political window will open at some point. We'll be able to price carbon one way or another. And there are a bunch of different ways you can do it. California and a handful of other states are using a cap and trade program that includes carbon pricing. Um, I think maybe the next incremental uh, step forward on carbon pricing could well be a border carbon adjustment which will try to level the trade playing field with other countries to reflect the greater carbon intensity in many cases of the goods that we import from those countries and provide a strong incentive for them to reduce that carbon intensity. The reason I think that may be the next thing is because the European Union is very close to doing that to us. Uh, they've actually got really good standards in place and they would like to impose carbon levies on things coming in from the United States and elsewhere. And I'm urging them to do it because uh, it gives us kind of the the setup to go ahead and, and uh, reciprocate. Uh, the other kind of highly possible carbon pricing mechanism would involve transportation fuels. So with all of this push for EVs and with the industry stepping up and making commitments, California obviously leading the way, uh, we're gonna very quickly have to address the fact that um, our transportation infrastructure is funded largely by a gas tax. And that gas tax, is a, it's a little bit like funding your schools with a tobacco tax. You want people to smoke less and they're going to smoke less, uh, which is great. But at some point, you got to make up for the declining revenue stream. 
and we are already um, in a deficit on our highway trust fund. So the time is now to start thinking about replacing the gas tax with something that's forward looking that maybe builds in um, a fee based on the carbon intensity of all transportation fuel, including electricity, depending on where you charge your cars. That's it's something I've been pushing for a few years and uh, I'm kind of hopeful that we'll get to that sooner rather than later. Well, thank you, Congressman. Uh, I have a question for you, uh, which is really the theme of this entire event. What can we uh, citizens do in terms of political action to help save democracy and the planet? I know it's a big question, yeah. but that's really what we're here for. What would yeah, be some highlights that you'd reason. recommend? Yeah. Thank you. The answer, first of all, it's great that so many people care enough about these things to show up tonight and spend a little Zoom time with all of us. That is awesome. That's encouraging. And thank you for uh, bringing everyone together. But what I would say is that we should do all of us everything you possibly can. You know, we're all going to have different uh, levels of resources, different amounts of time we can dedicate to this campaign, but it's all about the campaign. And sitting around on Facebook and Twitter, you know, is, is not maybe the most impactful way to uh, do our part to win these elections. Uh, if you could actually volunteer and do postcards or text messages or, uh, you know, in a, in a few weeks, I'm going to be renting out a bus to take people into Josh Harder's district in the Central Valley to knock on doors uh, in one of the most critical swing districts that we've got in California. Um, if you want to be part of that, just let us know. You can email me at info at jaredhuffman.com and we will plug you in and you can go knock on some doors. But uh, there's no shortage of political activists on this call that probably have other uh, phone banking and canvassing and uh, other activities. There are candidates that are in some of the most hotly contested races in America that are continuing to come through Marin and Sonoma County all the time to raise money. And if you can help them out and you know show up, I guess what I would what I would advise uh, is follow your brain at least as much as your heart. Uh, I think we would all love to support the the guy who's running against Kevin McCarthy, but he's going to lose, and it's probably better that we think about supporting Josh Harder or maybe someone in a, in a race where there's at least some objective reason to think that we can win it. The margins are going to be super tight. Uh, if we hold our majority and grow it in the Senate, it's going to be by one or two senators. If we hold our majority and grow it in the House, it may well be just as close. So I think showing some discipline and figuring out where to leverage your support for the most viable critical race uh, would be the approach I would suggest. Thank you, Congress. And one last question. Uh, this one is from David Fox. Uh, Congressman, is there any support for making California's discontinuing new gas car sales in 2035 to be a federal plan too soon? Or is it moot since enough states are already on board? Well, look, California is the fifth largest economy in the world. And when California says every new car has got to meet this standard, you know, the automobile industry can't just build different vehicles for California and for the rest. You know, California is the tail that wags the dog of what our national standard is going to be. So, you know, I'm all for federalizing the standard if we can. The problem when you try to do that is often um, back here in Washington, people want to weaken the California rule as a trade off for having a federal rule that applies everywhere. And I, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in setting the highest standard and then leaning in on the industry and everyone else to, to make that happen. So I, I feel pretty good about the impact of what California has done. The industry has to change in response to that California rule. And that change is gonna, for all intents and purposes, uh, be something that happens all over the country and, and really all over the world because the European Union and others are with us on this too. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, and uh, to close, uh, I will uh, ask a question from Deirdre uh, at Resilient Neighborhoods. Uh, she asks, uh, what is the one most impactful action that you are working on and in which we can support you? Oh, boy, one. Um, it, it's hard to point to one. Uh, I feel like I'm uh, spread pretty thin these days. Um, 
but I, I think making sure that we get electrification right is the most important thing. Uh, and the transportation sector is now the largest emitting sector. So um, not to say we shouldn't continue to push in the power sector and cleaning up the grid, but um, a lot of that is already happening and we've got to make sure we push ahead on electrifying transportation. There are things we can do locally at the state level and nationally to see that through. Uh, but I regard that as the biggest game changer because it's it's what kills the fossil fuel industry. Mm -hmm. That is the one place where they still got us. And if we can uh, break that stranglehold, uh, it's just great on every level. Uh, and it is the key to meeting our climate goals, in my opinion. Well, thank you, Congressman, for your inspiring talk and your great answers and for all that you do for our communities. You're our hero. <laughs> We're behind you. And we really appreciate that you made time uh, uh, to speak with us. My pleasure, Fabrice. Back at you. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. And now we will ask Bill to introduce our next speaker. Thanks, Fabrice. Uh, and good evening, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Ellie Cohen as CEO of the Climate Center. Uh, Ellie oversees the Climate Safe California campaign for a uh, carbon negative and equity positive future. She has uh, influenced Governor Newsom to seek greenhouse gas emission cuts of 55% by 2030, and also to open pathways to net zero emissions by 2035. Uh, she's also accomplished state legislation <clears throat> requiring uh, natural carbon sequestration and she secured state funding of a of billion dollars for residential solar and storage, mostly for low-income families. As you're about to hear, Ellie is a powerful advocate for scientific fact as the uh, bedrock foundation of climate policy, of democratic decision-making, and of the leadership that California can offer the planet to reverse climate change. Ellie. Thank you so much, Bill. I have to apologize for my voice. I'm just getting over COVID. It's not fun, but I'm so glad to be here with this incredible group of people. And thank you for that kind introduction, Bill and Fabrice, Bell, everyone who has organized this incredible evening. And I know Congressman Huffman may have already left, but I really want to acknowledge his phenomenal leadership in Washington. That's just making such a huge difference for us in California, for the whole country, and for the world. We just have to remember that at this moment, more than 30 million Pakistani people are displaced due to flooding that is truly of biblical proportions way beyond what has been projected for them. And there is no relief in sight for these people. Europe is experiencing record-breaking heat even today, and their rivers are drying up. We broke another record globally uh, recently by exceeding 419 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that hasn't been seen on our planet for four and a half million years. So our, our task is really clear. Right? These record-breaking extremes that we're experiencing here in California with the heat waves last week and wildfires and even flooding in Southern California, just another example of the regional off the chart extremes that are becoming all too common. So the science is clear and our task is clear that we have to cut emissions in half. This is what the global climate scientists are telling us. And we have to start, start drawing down past climate pollution, past emissions that we already put into the atmosphere in order to secure a stable and livable climate. But as you all know, and as we've already heard from Fabrice, that we can only do this we can only achieve the climate policies that are needed if we have a thriving democracy. When I think of democracy and what it means, I think of a system that is supposed to be a system of government of the people, by the people, and for the people, for all the people. And unfortunately, and Congressman Huffman touched on this, we have some very big moneyed interests that have prevented us from truly realizing our democratic values in our country. And I'll put the oil and gas companies up there right at the top. 
and even investor-owned utilities. A recent study just came out showing that they too have worked to, for decades, to hide the truth about what's happening with climate change, to systematically delay action, and often outright lie to ensure that their business model and their profits continue. So yeah, corporate citizenship, if you will, is undermining the basis for democracy and the basis for what we need to do to secure a stable, safe, and equitable climate future. And that kind of influence of oil and gas companies, we don't think of it normally as happening in California. We know it's happening with Manchin. Uh, somebody just reported today that Next Era Energy, this utility giant, which is a stakeholder in the Mountain Valley Pipeline that's part of a side deal with Manchin to have supported the IRA, uh, that they're one of the biggest donors to Senator Manchin, but also to Senator Schumer. So one of the issues here is we got to get some of that big oil money out of politics so that we can make laws that truly are in the interest of the people and for the people. And this type of influence is evident here in California. And big oil has a huge stranglehold on our policymakers here in California. We have fallen behind in our policymaking until the last couple of months. And uh, we have a super majority of Democrats, but a majority of Democrats that receive significant funds from oil and gas. The fossil fuel interests, mostly represented by WISPA, the Western States Petroleum Association, and PG&E spent over $6 million lobbying in just the first three months of this year. And when you look at the list of bills and policies that they're working against, it's exactly the policies that groups like the Climate Center and others are working to support. It's everything that the environmental justice community has been working for, they're working against it. And they're saying sometimes they're doing it in the interest of these communities, which they are not at all. And all this truly is at the expense of frontline communities, working class communities, mostly communities of color, who for decades have been subject to toxic carcinogenic pollution from our fossil fuel economy. It's time to turn that around. We have to for our collective future. The new IRA bill is a big step forward and it really, and combined with other federal bills that uh, passed last year, like the Infrastructure Act, are already bringing resources to California and already making a difference so that our elected officials can't hide behind, we don't have enough money, we can't do it. This is not about money. It's about political will to take the action that's needed. We have the solutions, we just need the political will. So what happened recently in California? Well, many of you know that Governor Newsom stepped up in a way that he hadn't yet in his administration. In late July, he announced that, uh, which is very late in our legislative process, which ends August 31st, uh, he announced that he was prioritizing five climate priorities. Um, it's interesting why he chose at that moment, but I believe that it was driven in part by what was happening in Washington. And IRA wasn't passed yet, but it was very close to being passed. And all of a sudden, California, whose goal is 40% emissions reductions by 2030, is suddenly far behind what's happening federally instead of leading uh, and being the, the tail that wags the dog, as the Congressman just said. Maybe uh, it's part because he took out some ads in Florida. Maybe he has presidential aspirations. And uh, some of those ads uh, were uh, offended WISPA, the Western States Petroleum Association, and they took out ads then blaming Newsom for the increased cost of gas. Uh, maybe it's driven by a growing climate movement that all of us who are here today represent. More and more people are working together, getting organized, making a difference. What happened at the state level was unprecedented in that we had the big green environmental groups, organizations like the Climate Center, working hand in hand with environmental justice groups, all on common policy goals for the first time. It's working. So in the past six weeks, Governor Newsom announced five climate policy pillars uh, and presented these bills. It was at the 11th hour to the legislature in August to codify carbon neutrality by no later than 2045, protect communities from the impacts of the oil and gas economy, establishing setbacks of 3,200 feet between new oil and gas wells and schools and playgrounds and health centers, and also putting into place new laws to help reduce pollution from existing wells, creating clean electricity targets of 90% by 
90% clean electricity by 2035 and 95% by 2040 towards our goal of 100% by 2045. And then advancing ways of removing past carbon pollution, which has to be part of the equation to get us where we need to go. And uh, that includes establishing a regulatory framework for technological carbon removal for the first time and requiring the state to set goals for and invest big time in natural carbon sequestration on our natural working in urban lands. And that was a bill that the Climate Center led on. What's interesting is that the one law that didn't pass that had been part of the five pillars of the governors was to accelerate climate action by 2030 to get to 55% below 1990 levels. We know we can, our own analysis at the Climate Center shows we can exceed that. Another analysis that came out just a few weeks ago showed that that would create over 200,000 jobs and add $50 billion to our economy. The bottom line is getting to carbon neutrality by 2045 is way too late. We know what's already happening with just 1.1, 1.2 C warming and uh, going beyond 1.5 and waiting for another 20 years to get there is just not acceptable. Delayed climate action costs huge amounts in terms of dollars and lives. It bankrupts our future. There was one study that came out last year showing that eliminating fossil fuel pollution in buildings and transportation in California is, would save us $44 billion a year in improved health and avoid 5,000 premature deaths. We have gotta invest big now to save dollars and lives. So what are the political actions that can make a difference? We've heard it. On the federal level, well, we need to stop that dirty deal with Manchin. We gotta get the president to announce a climate emergency and use all the tools at, uh, his, that are available to him. And here for us in Marin and in the Bay Area in California, we need to get involved and we can get involved with 350 Bay Area, with Indivisible Marin. There are other groups that you can go and get involved in, not just to be sure you're voting, but to get out the vote and to write those postcards and make those phone calls. It makes a huge difference. The Climate Center recently established a C4 so we could do more political work in California. And we established a PAC, the Climate Safe California PAC. And so we are working on the ground right now doing grassroots organizing in two of the closest races in the state in Sacramento and San Fernando Valley. Because even though we have this climate super majority of climate leaders, or sorry, we have a super majority of Democrats, we do not have a majority of climate leaders. And we need to get 21 votes to win policy in the legislature, in the Senate, and 41 votes in the assembly. We also need to get the California Air Resources Board to pick up where the legislature left off. They are now finishing their five-year plan for uh, what they call the scoping plan. It's like a climate action blueprint for the next five years. So the legislature didn't pass getting to 55% cuts by 2030, but the California Air Resources Board can do it. And if you wanna see other kinds of political actions you can take, you can go to the Climate Center and, uh, and look under uh, taking action or the climatecenter.org slash engage. And you can see a number of other actions that you can take to influence state policy. But the bottom line is we have to accelerate our goals for emissions reductions. We have to accelerate our goals for natural carbon sequestration. We have to make sure that we can build the grid for the future, the decentralized, clean, affordable energy grid for the future that will allow us to be more resilient to planned or unplanned outages to greater extreme events and to secure the kind of equitable climate future that we all want. We've learned from COVID, we need coordinated government action and we need individual action to make a difference. Every 10th of a degree of warming matters. I'm gonna wrap up right now. We can make a difference. Individual actions really add up quickly. We saw that we didn't have rolling blackouts last week because so many people took the small step of reducing their electricity use between four and nine. We can elect climate champions and hold them accountable. We can take action in our hometowns and in our counties. We know that as goes California, goes the world. Our house is on fire. We have to break the stranglehold of oil and gas interests and it will open up a world of possibilities. Together, we can secure a carbon negative and equity positive future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ellie, for this inspiring talk and for all that you do at the Climate Center. We put some links to your Take Action page uh, in text chat. Definitely check it out. 
And if you have a question for Ellie, uh, please type it in text chat. And we're going to answer uh, all the questions uh, after the last talk uh, so that we can get a couple more speakers to uh, present uh, their perspectives. Uh, if it's all right with you, Ellie, we'd uh, love it if you could answer a few questions then. Absolutely. Uh, Thank good. you so much. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce Stephanie Moulton Peters, Marin County Supervisor for Southern Marin. Stephanie has served in public office for over 12 years as Mill Valley Mayor, as board member for many local organizations, such as the uh, Transportation Authority of Marin, Marin Transit District, Bay Wave. Uh, she is, has a long track record in environmental action promoting clean energy to reduce emissions in our area. And she brings that valuable experience in all her roles with a focus on transparent, responsive, and inclusive local government. Tonight, she will talk about climate action and local democracy. Take it away, Stephanie. Thank you, Fabrice. And good evening, everyone. It is really wonderful to be with you and see so many familiar faces in the group tonight and to be part of this accomplished panel of North Bay climate leaders. And Ellie Cullen, if this is you after recovering from COVID, holy cow, <laughs> I want your energy and to bottle it. So anyway, wonderful to be with you and follow Congressman Huffman and Ellie Cullen. They've given you the big picture and then the California state picture. I'm gonna pick it up from here and talk about what's happening locally and the importance of federal funding action to reach net zero greenhouse gas in Marin County. In our local jurisdictions, through the work of Marin Can, through uh, Sustainable Marin and all of our partners here in Marin County. I wanna open tonight with the thought that at its most elemental level, democracy is a very local undertaking carried out in our communities on the ground every day. Democracy is lived locally and democracy is lived collectively across the state and across the country when we join with other local communities and work together for what we believe in. A living democracy is what's urgently needed in these times. I'm wearing one of my favorite buttons. You've heard this before. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And I really believe that. The founders of our nation intended for local government to be carried out at the local level by groups of individuals banding together to create the policies to address the issues and challenges they faced. Many of us in this room have been doing this for many, many years. And we know that people get most engaged when the issues are in their own backyard or in their own home. That's when they show up and participate in town halls and public hearings and by taking action locally. And that's what I'm gonna to encourage tonight, in addition to the action you're taking at the state and national levels. It's one of the things that's so great about the new federal IRA funding. It makes it more possible for people at all economic levels to step up and take action, to participate locally in reducing greenhouse gases in our communities, in our homes and in our own backyards. The new federal funds broaden the expanse of participation and extend the time horizon for participation, in some cases for up to a full 10 years, which supports the successful passage of our local ordinances and the implementation of plans to really move the needle in both building electrification and transportation, the two areas I'm gonna fo focus on primarily tonight. But with the federal funding, I think we can finally move the needle to the tipping point of really the systemic change that we've wanted to see for a long time. So what are the opportunities to put the new federal funds to work locally here in Marin? And what are the specific actions that our local governments will take to put this money to work? Again, I'm focusing primarily on our green building and electrification of our transportation system because as many of you know, about 50% of Marin's greenhouse gases are transportation related and 30% are building related. And so the, the two combined get us 80% of the way there. And these are issues that the local government has a critical role to play. 
For some of you who uh, are new to the conversation, what I'm going to say uh, may seem new to you. For others of you, uh, building, uh, green building and green transportation are things we've been working on for many, many years. Uh, but the great news is the infusion of funds at the federal level enables more local governments and people to take action with more energy commitment and the ability to accomplish what we've been trying to accomplish for a very long time. So let's talk about building electrification. You may have seen the recent grand jury report, Electrifying Marin's Building, a countywide approach. This, align, this report aligns very well with the green building ordinance that the County of Marin is currently drafting and sharing as a model with the cities and towns in Marin County. This ordinance would propose that all new construction would be all electric, no more natural gas, and that major renovations on existing housing would be energy efficient and uh, electrify uh, appliances uh, and other features. There would be a checklist uh, of items that uh, renovations can work through to achieve a certain point score that um, would electrify a great amount of the renovation. So we expect the green building ordinance to come to the Board of Supervisors in December. And I wanna say Fairfax is ahead of the game. They already passed their green reach codes uh, in March. Sausalito and other jurisdictions are considering them now. Uh, and I want to uh, acknowledge uh, council member uh, from San Rafael, uh, Micah uh, Lawrence Gulati, who is the head of the Marin Council Members Climate Change Organization. And this is a committee of local electives working in our cities and towns in conjunction with the county policymakers working together to coordinate action. A similar thing happens at the staff level with our Marin Climate Energy Partnership, where our city staffs are working together. And so we get this, this magnifier uh, with local policies so that we're rowing together and acting as one and getting the benefit of having this green ordinance ready to go starting uh, at the end of this year. And so as the federal funds are coming in, our local cities and towns will be in a position to promulgate their ordinances and get busy and create change. What can you do? Lobby for the passage of the green building ordinance in your city or town or at the county this December. With regard to EV promotion and infrastructure, as many of you know, there's both the promoting consumer demand and then increasing supply of our electric charging infrastructure. Promoting consumer demand, the county has an ambitious 2030 target for passenger EVs to shift 45% of registered vehicles to zero emission vehicles by 2030. We are currently at 5% of our existing passenger vehicles. So we have a ways to go in the next several years. For the past four years, Drive Clean Marin and Drive Clean Bay Area, sponsored by our own Cool the Earth team, have been the major source of EV promotion, education, and awareness in Marin. Their easy access to online EV information, live ride and drive events, and purchasing agreements with Cartelligen make it easy to make the switch to EVs. I know because I worked with drive clean Marin to buy, to lease my own EV a couple of years ago. We'll continue to work with them through the Transportation Authority of Marin and the county will also bringing on, be bringing on additional marketing resources to get the word out about how easy it is to make the switch. The federal funds and tax credits will help consumers make this switch. We're still working out which vehicles will be uh, eligible for tax credits, but that'll get sorted out. And the good news is that there's a new tax credit for previously owned electric, electric vehicles, and that will make more people able to buy these vehicles. There will be tax uh, credits as well as uh, uh, payments in lieu of payments to low income customers who would not otherwise uh, uh, qualify for a credit. There are subsidies that will be made available to low income when they purchase clean vehicles. 
Uh, then we move to increasing our supply of charging infrastructure. And again, this is an effort, uh, Transportation Authority of Marin, as well as Marin Clean Energy and PG&E. Uh, Transportation of Marin is focused on the public charging facilities in our cities and towns and with our schools, making technical advice available to them and helping our jurisdictions provide more charging points at public locations. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar and may know more than I do about the programs through Marin Clean Energy as well as PG&E. One of the critical needs we still have to uh, conquer is charging points at multifamily housing. Uh, we, we have not been able to crack that nut just yet uh, with how to get those charging ports into multifamily housing, but it's really critical that we do this. Uh, just a few other statistics about the landscape in EVs in Marin County. Uh, in the first half of 2021, zero emission vehicles made up 10, almost 11% of new car sales in the state. Tesla accounted for half of that. In Marin County, uh, the electric vehicle registrations uh, need to uh, increase by 25% each year to reach the goals that we have set for 2030. The good news is between 2016 and 2020, EV growth rates in Marin County are average 28%. So uh, we are making progress and we need to keep it up. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say just a few things and then uh, save the rest of my time. Oh, I'm seeing a sign from our friends at Resilient, uh, Resilient Neighborhoods. I meant to put in a plug. Their program is a wonderful way that all of our residents can understand and learn more about clean vehicles and electrification and preparedness. And uh, it's one of the best ways to reach uh, and create change in Marin County. They are one of the Drawdown Marin featured um, initiatives this year. Finally, I think there's a role, and I always feel this way about Marin County, that we are a great place to pilot test uh, new innovation. We're small, our local governments are small, we don't have that much bureaucracy to uh, get over, and we have very creative, innovative thinkers. I'm hopeful that our cities and towns will pilot test things like streetlight EV charging in some of our downtowns and see how that helps move the needle uh, with EV adoption. And again, I, I'm hopeful uh, not only with multifamily housing, but that in the public housing that Marin County has, including Golden Gate Village in Marin City, that our green renovation for these projects and maintenance will include EV charging stations and green electrification. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold there for now. What can you do? Again, come out for the green uh, ordinance, the green building ordinance, come out for EV uh, charging stations in your communities uh, and make your voices heard and support those candidates running for local office that are supporting these initiatives. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Moulton Peters for this uh, wonderful talk. Um, I see we have questions for you in text chat, so I encourage you if you're willing to answer a few of them in text chat, and we'll answer more questions after the last talk, which is coming up now. Um, and uh, now Bell Cole is going to introduce our next speaker. So Laura Nish is Executive Director of 350 Bay Area and 350 Bay Area Action. After a long career providing strategy and marketing consulting to large corporations and startups, Laura, Laura left the corporate world to pursue her passion, addressing injustice. Because the changing climate amplifies injustice everywhere, it was a natural fit to work on getting real climate solutions passed with 350 Bay Area. We thank you for being here. And she's gonna talk about how we can help democracy and climate with, with the midterm elections. Take it away, Laura. Thank you so much, Bell. And, and what a great job this team has done putting this event together. I'm very pleased to be here and to be able to share some of this with um, this big group that showed up. 
So this is exciting. I'm going to share some slides just to break up the, the format a little bit. So first, a little bit about our organizations. Uh, 350 Bay Area focuses on building the movement to quickly shift to a clean energy economy with justice at the center. We work both from the top down and the bottom up, building the momentum for action and digging in on policy solutions. And we work at the regional and state level and our local groups uh, focus on city and county level actions. 350 Barrier Action is organized as a C4, which removes constraints on lobbying and electoral endorsements. This side of the organization can be as partisan as it wants. So why are we focusing people, uh, focusing on getting people to show up at the polls? Because it works. It makes a big difference. Uh, so many of our key races are won or lost on tiny margins. So unfortunately, and not surprisingly, the more effort it takes, the better the results. So we do see generally better results with canvassing and uh, phone banking than we do with postcarding and texting. But so many of the races are so narrowly won that it's definitely worth doing all these things. These approaches all move the needle and research suggests that voters are cumulatively influenced. So multiple touches do improve the likelihood of them showing up at the polls. Uh, wanted to highlight a little bit of the results from Vote Forward. Uh, they specialize in outreach using partially handwritten letters and their, their work is to continually refine that model. And you can see here that it actually does improve the um, people showing up at the polls. So even though calls and canvassing are the most effective, it really does all count. And maybe you're one of those people who feels a little bit of anxious about the thought of making a phone call or showing up at somebody's door. Well, <laughs> I am too. I always get a little bit uh, anxious right before I start my phone banking sessions. Uh, the hardest part really is just getting started. Most of the time we just leave messages for people. And sometimes I totally bumble those voicemail messages, and which makes you feel a little bit funny about participating. Uh, and sometimes, unfortunately, people really are rude, but it's very rare and you just take a minute to shake it off. But I'll say every once in a while, you have an interaction with somebody that gives you such hope and is truly glorious and it makes it all worth it. So think of it like going to Las Vegas and spinning the wheel because you never know what's going to come up with. So 350 Bay Area Action organizes our phone banking with Activate America for their easy to use system and their strategic approach. Our phone banking sessions intentionally focus on gathering people to share their stories and build community. People show up pretty consistently to take part in that camaraderie. And so we share our stories, good and bad, we laugh, we shake it off. And the good stories really do keep everybody inspired. Canvassing can sound a little bit intimidating too. I always feel a little bit nervous before I start with my present self asking my past self why I was so ambitious on my behalf. But I do always enjoy canvassing. I've done a lot of it and it's fun. <clears throat> you work with a partner, you get a little exercise, you, mo you meet mostly nice people. I will say that I've even had fun canvassing in Iowa and New Hampshire in the middle of winter, and I recommend wearing very good shoes. So if postcards and letters and text hold more appeal, by all means, jump in. It moves the needle, it makes a difference. And if what, you're one of those crafty people, so completely I'm not, this can be a way for you to express that. And so some of my artsy friends uh, really do enjoy sitting down and making these beautiful. So here are some options that, that I just happen to know about. Uh, if you have questions about any of these, but 350 Bay Area Action and Activate America, visit their websites. I don't speak for them. We've just found them to be effective. So I like to highlight Next Gen America because they're really focusing on getting young people out and activated. So they registered about uh, a million and a half young people recently, which is huge. <laughs> 
Yay. And then they helped get over four and a half million people to the young people to the polls in 2020. They had the reach and the scale to really organize and address this critical segment. Mobilize is a good place to uh, start just to kind of find things that are going on locally. It's kind of a clearinghouse organization. And they will, you could type in what you want to do or where you want to show up, and they help direct you to um, give you good ideas for that. Um, so Activate America doesn't just do phone banking. You can slot in there for text banking, postcarding, and they'll even uh, let you know about some canvassing events for the, the uh, folks that they're promoting. Uh, you can sign up for the 350 Barry Action phone banks on our website and join that community as well. It's on the site. And then probably most of you have heard of the Environmental Voter Project, which is nonpartisan. They direct their efforts uh, to folks who rank themselves as very concerned about the environment and climate and put that at the top of their voting priority list. Uh, oddly, this group votes at a below average rate, which is kind of mind boggling. Uh, so they're, they're kind of a fun one to to check out and they're nonpartisan and um, very, very targeted. So what's at stake? Well, <laughs> we're up against the big money, which has for decades bought outsized influence, spreading misinformation and getting us to this point where we just have very little time to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. So it's us versus the oligarchs. Please feel free to use that term. I'm trying to get everybody to use that term. Uh, anyway, for a long time, they didn't just tip the scales, they owned the scales. And slowly but surely, we're making a difference. This particular protester here is celebrating the recent forward momentum, but you can see we still have a long way to go. In all seriousness, we're really in trouble. In the simplest terms, and yes, setting aside nuance and complexity for a moment, these guys, the oligarchs, they don't wanna give up any of what they think is rightfully theirs, no matter the cost. For many decades, they've spread propaganda to delay action. And these messages have largely worked. Messages like your voice, your vote doesn't matter and both sides are the same. Government is the problem, not the solution. Much of this has taken deep root. Amy Westervelt's Drilled podcast does a really great job reporting on this decades-long effort to shape the narrative and tip the scales. Petroleum money is big money, really beyond our capacity to comprehend. And that big money is behind efforts to consolidate power in the hands of the already wealthy and dismantle our, our democracy. Those who seek to protect our democracy are late to the game. We've overlooked and normalized power grabs dressed up in legalese and hidden in local elections for boring administrative seats. So for the foreseeable, foreseeable future, every election is going to be the most important election of our lives up and down the ticket. So choose something. We all have some measured mix of time, talent, and financial resources, really, sit down with a cup of tea and figure out what you can do. To be clear, it's not all up to you or me or Pete the protester. People are busy and an hour a week will still make a difference. If you're a crafty one, do some postcarding while listening to music or watching TV. Need a, gate, a getaway weekend with friends? Go somewhere with a key Senate race and spend an afternoon meeting the locals. And talk to your friends. We're not gonna convince Trumpers of anything, so don't bother. But we have to talk about the enormity of this moment. Extremism on the right is getting normalized. So we need to normalize talking about the threat of climate change and the forces that are undermining our democracy in order to block the dismantling of the dirty fossil fuel industries. We can do this, but only if we make a plan and commit to it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, for your wonderful talk and for all that you do at 350 Bay Area. Thank you. Uh, and I really appreciate that you painted a good uh, overview of all the different ways that we can take action. Uh, if anyone has a question for Laura, please type it in text chat and you will also find links 
to their take action page, uh, which we encourage you to visit. Um, so we're now um, starting uh, the question and answer session. Uh, I would like to ask our co-hosts, uh, Bill and Bell, to um, ask a, a couple questions and maybe start with Bill. You had a, a question uh, for Stephanie, I believe? Yeah, uh, I do. Um, I'd like to ask Stephanie uh, what she thinks are the greatest barriers uh, to meaningful climate actions uh, by local and county governments uh, here in Marin. And, and how citizen voices can help overcome those uh, barriers? That is a great question, Bill. And in fact, I was asking the executive director, uh, the Transportation Authority of Marin, uh, Ann Richmond, that same question today about barriers. And, I'll t and, and particularly with regard to uh, electric vehicle uh, infrastructure, uh, adoption in cities and towns, uh, the public infrastructure as we were talking about. Uh, we have very small staffs. They have a broad range of duties to accomplish and they're always stretched thin. Uh, and so uh, getting more charge points in our cities and towns has been a slow process. Uh, and the funding has had something to do with that too. But of course, I think that's gonna change. So um, I think this is where, Bill, the voices at the podium, at the council meeting saying, we really need to install more charging ports in our communities, along our corridors, in our central downtowns. Let's try a pilot with electric street lights or what have you. But I think people calling for this kind of action, we know the squeaky wheel gets the action uh, and making this a more urgent demand, our local governments will help get it prioritized more highly. So that's one thing I think that would be helpful that we can all be part of. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question uh, that I would like to pose to all of the speakers and it really has to do with messaging. Uh, I mean, we have these great successes legislatively now. Uh, we're, we're really gonna be quite strong when we get to COP27 in Egypt this November. Uh, we have a lot of momentum behind us. Uh, should this, what kind of messaging do we wanna put forth in our phone banks and in our door-to-door -door discussions? Or do we not try to, bring too much of that story out, but I think we should bring the story out. I'm curious about what you think, both Ellie and, and uh, Stephanie and uh, Laura, because you shape, you get to shape the stories that, that we're gonna try to bring to people between now and the midterms. All right, I'll um, jump in. Yeah, <laughs> you, Ellie. <laughs> please, Laura, go ahead. Well, I think that's that was you know that was part of what I was the, sort of the ending statement of what I was talking about is we have to find the balance between which we're always trying to find like look there's a path forward there's hope there's reason to stay engaged and boy do we have to get to it right now we really have to talk about these things that are hard to talk about um, in a way that um, that makes it okay for this con these conversations to be happening. So um, it's, people are really tired of hearing that this election is the election of your lifetime. It's the one that counts. And I think that we have to break through that kind of exhaustion and say, you know, we really are, this is a long-term process, democracy is messy. And it, you know, you can get involved and that can be sort of enriching and fun, and but it's also necessary. Ellie. <laughs> I had a very different answer, which was more along the lines of making clear who the enemy is. I think we're most successful when we're really clear who are the bad guys and who are the good guys. And the bad guys are the oil oligarchs. I don't know if I'm saying it correctly, Laura, but <laughs> I, I think that's a great term. And uh, we need to be clear that when 
we see that our utility bills are a lot more expensive or our food is a lot more expensive, which it will continue to get, our water will become more expensive, that it all comes back to these oil and gas oligarchs who will not do anything to keep their profit margins. It doesn't matter about the future of humanity. They've known the science since the 1960s, the 1970s, the same with the big utilities. So we had to make it real clear that in order to have an affordable and safe and equitable future where everybody is being considered, then we need to do it in a way that not that discontinues the power of big oil. So, so I'll follow up as a politician would by saying there's a lot of answers to this question about what the <laughs> messaging should be. Uh, and uh, what I love about this event tonight and all of the Time to Lead on Climate events is that you, you get people fired up with the information and the urgency and then you give them a list of things to do. And so I think what, what I've learned over time is that different things provoke action by different people. There isn't any one message we can give people uh, that will get them all out to do anything. So, so we need different strategies, but uh, some of you know, I was at the Harvard Kennedy School this summer learning how to do government better. And there was a professor on climate change who said, look, climate change is still kind of diffuse for people. You've got to reach them with things they care about right now. And so whether that is the wildfires, whether that is the rising fuel costs, whether that is their grandchildren's future, you know, find out what that is and, and intertwine your policies with how what you're doing is going to make what they care about better. So uh, that's, that's my message is go deep with people, find out what they care about and speak to them from that place about how what we're trying to do makes what they care about better. Thank you all for these great answers. Uh, uh, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions from text chat. Uh, I see a question for Ellie Cohen from Marilyn Price. I am confused that some environmental groups who say to get behind mansion side deal and others say we should fight it. What is your opinion? We should, <coughs> there, that's my dog. I apologize. I, hold on one second. It must have been the, the mention of mansion's name. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. Well, we've trained everyone in our household to be very pro-climate action. <laughs> so they're very responsive. No, I apologize for that. But uh, I think that we must take a stand against it. Does that mean that that's what will happen in Congress in the next few weeks? Probably not. <laughs> but we have to take a stand against it because it will directly impact and already is even just the building out of it that's happened so far, like the Mountain Valley Pipeline or the uh, Alaska uh, drilling. It's already hurting frontline communities. And when people say that we need climate justice, what we're really talking about is that we can't continue as an oil and gas economy globally, truthfully, without it, every time we are burning fossil fuels, we are doing it on the backs of lower income people, of people of color, of uh, working class communities in California and all over the world. And so allowing this to go forward is saying, we're gonna have climate progress at the expense of these communities again. It's not acceptable. We have to fight it. We have to keep fighting it. And we're starting to win, just to be clear. The federal government policies include 40% of funds allocated not exactly 40%, a significant portion of the almost $400 billion, $60 billion is allocated to lower income communities. And so we need to prioritize that because we will not, never have solved the climate crisis if we don't stop the pollution that is primarily killing frontline communities. Thank you, Ellie, a great answer. Uh, I see another question from uh, Al Grummet. This one is for Stephanie. Uh, thank you for your leadership. How can we ensure that best in class organizations like Ride and Drive Clean and Resilient Neighborhoods have a stable flow of funds from the county to implement their community engagement programs? The current flow of funding seems to be highly variable and somewhat uncertain. Yeah, yeah. 
I saw that question and I decided not to answer it on, on the chat, hoping you would ask it out loud because I think it is such an important question. Uh, look, these baseline programs are exactly what you say. They are foundational to reaching our community with very important, actionable information. So uh, I currently serve on the board of MV CAN uh, with Bill Carney and we are just getting started figuring out how we're going to go forward as a nonprofit. And currently the emphasis is funding uh, for new initiatives and fundraising for new initiatives. But it would seem to me that we might consider allocating a certain amount of baseline funding to foundational programs that we know help us move the needle every day and every year. So that's one answer. Uh, and I'm going to give it some more thought now because I think it's a really important question. Thank you. You're very welcome, uh, Stephanie. Well, Ellie? I, I would like to just add to it. One of the reasons that I decided to focus on at working at the Climate Center, focusing on state policy, is because I do think that state policy, particularly in California, can unleash innovation, can unleash that efforts of local government leaders and local government organizations and our communities. And so we can only do so much, but if we don't have those resources, it's much, much harder. We can make a difference. Everything that we do can demonstrate what can happen, but to really do it at the speed and scale needed, we need to unlock these resources. And that to me happens both at state policy and federal policy. So we need all of it to happen simultaneously. And we were able to, at the Climate Center, to get $30 million approved in this year's budget for the California Public Utilities Commission to pay for people from local communities to be involved in the PUC process. That is making democracy work. Well, thank you, Ellie. And on that note, what I'd like to do is uh, move on to our next section, which is green tips from our community. But I encourage you all to uh, answer any leftover questions in chat and uh, hopefully stay with us and continue to participate in chat while we uh, hear from our community. So I'm gonna share this screen here and I'm gonna ask uh, Bridget Mazzini, uh what uh green tips for political action have we gathered today well thanks fabrice um let me just make sure i'm unmuted okay um thanks again fabrice so tonight we're going to present a few great political action tips on effective ways we can support green leaders join phone banks get the vote out and to fight for fair elections um, so each of these will take a minute or less and we'll leave you with some good ideas for taking action from our green chain members uh, so I'll start off with my tip to donate to green leaders. Um, let me start off by saying I'm not a big financial donor, but I want what I donate to count. So I learned about an organization called Give Green during the 2020 election cycle at a green change meetup just like tonight. Um, in addition to supporting my local green leaders who I know a lot about, I wanted to invest in some of the races in other parts of the country where there was less support for aggressive climate action. So Give Green helped me weed through my options and see where my money could have the biggest impact for the environment. They make donating quick, easy, and strategic. They highlight candidates and races where climate change is on the line, and they provide details about the candidates and their environmental policy contributions thus far. So you can find out information about races, not just for representatives and senators, but state attorney generals, lieutenant governors, state Supreme Court justices, et cetera. So I found it really helpful and I felt good about my donation decision based on learning about the candidates rather than sort of relying on my own spotty knowledge of races around the country. And one other good thing, um, when you donate through Give Green, you send a message to the candidate that you donated because of their environmental action. Um, so there are other organizations like Give Green. Feel free to put them in the text chat if you know of an organization, a resource that helped you to decide where to spend your election dollars to support green leaders. So thank you. And next up, Fabrice Florin has two tips for us. All right. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Bridget. And I want to say that all these tips are in text chat. Uh, so you can click on them and there's links to all the organizations that you can join. So my first tip for you today is, yes, join a phone or text bank. 
Uh, it's a great way to get people to uh, vote and register and cast their votes. I've enjoyed reaching out to voters across America through a variety of phone banks in recent years. And many voters have told me that my call actually made a difference for them. And it's been very fulfilling to support other Americans outside of my usual circles. And it's even more fun when you do it with a group of people. This is a, a phone bank from Democracy Action Marin, a really wonderful organization to join. We're going to uh, post links to uh, a variety of groups, including 350 Bay Area Action, uh, Democracy Action, the Bay Area Coalition, the Environmental Voter Project, uh, Indivisible Marin, Swing Left, Sister District. All this is going to be in text chat. And you can also find phone banks near you on sites like mobilize.us, which uh, Laura mentioned. So give it a try. Uh, those are most of the time virtual events nowadays. So you can call from home and they usually have coaches and peers who can help you along the way. My next tip is going to be to physically go out and get out the vote. Uh, canvas in person, going door to door to help voters register and uh, cast their votes. It's even more effective in swing districts where every vote matters. Uh, in the 2018 midterm elections, I drove a few hundred miles to California Central Valley to canvas for Josh Harder, shown here with all of us, the canvassers. Uh, he was running for US Congress in the 10th district. So for several days, we rented an Airbnb with a bunch of friends. It was like, you know, the next best thing to ecotourism and you get to meet a lot more people. <laughs> we we uh, walked with other volunteers. We knocked on hundreds of doors throughout Modesto and its suburbs. It was a great experience. We got to meet voters from different ethnic uh, backgrounds, people we would not normally meet. And many of them, again, thanked us for assisting them. And we got Josh to win the house seat in, in, in CA-10, and we broke new records for civic engagement. So I invite you to give it a try. Uh, don't be shy and go get out the vote in a swing district near you, uh, as we did. Uh, there's some great organizations on the mobilized site. Uh, Bay Area Coalition is one, California Democratic Party, Swing left to name but, but a few. So those are my tips for you. Thank you, Fabrice. And next up, we have Anne Christine Strugnell with two tips for political action. Yeah, well, first I have to like, thank you, Fabrice, <laughs> for all you do. Uh, for those who are maybe a little less uh, enthusiastic, a little more timid, you can always serve as a poll worker. Being a poll worker is very important because uh, to actually, when we talk about accessibility, voting accessibility, that means more voting centers open more hours. And in order to do that, they need more poll workers. Apparently they use about, it takes about 1 million temporary workers to uh, help us run an election. And uh, serving as a poll worker is actually great. You get trained, you actually get paid. To, if you're interested in becoming a poll worker, you can just go to the, the site I went to is power the polls and they'll ask you what your availability is and you know which days you might be available to work and what kind of hours. So they're really working with you. So I would uh, highly recommend that as a way of getting involved. Then another way to get involved is, well, or to take political action is to go electric with some of these wonderful um, government rebates and other programs to help households electrify um, by offering uh, rebates if you uh, swap out your uh, gas water heater for an electric one and so on. You might be, I actually just found out today that, um, you know, rebate on a local level of rebates as well. We've got some coming on through Bayren and Electrify Marin and a lot of other organizations. But you might be wondering, well, why are we talking, wait a sec, we're talking electrification. Isn't this a standard green tip? Why, why is it coming in the political section? Well. It kind of speaks to something Stephanie was talking about. She said climate change seems diffuse to people. And what many of the common thread through many of these speakers talks is that many people wonder what difference does it make to you know, elect a certain party? Aren't, isn't everybody kind of the same? Does government involvement really make a difference? And what I think is um, really great about the green rebates is not just taking advantage of them for yourselves, but talking to other people and encouraging them to see that yes, government can make a powerful difference when it chooses to get involved. So we as citizens have a tremendous opportunity to participate in making that difference. So that's why this is actually a political tip as well as a save money and lower your own carbon footprint tip. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks so much to uh, 
all the speakers and, and hosts. Uh, my green tip is uh, addressing uh, something that, that I regard as critically important. I think a lot of the advocacy uh, that we've heard today kind of assumes that we have uh, a democracy in place uh, as opposed to an author authoritarian uh, regime. And unfortunately, the, um, the, the January 6th uh, uh, hearings have revealed just how close we've, we've come to sliding away from democracy into something much more dangerous and weaker. And it also shows that, that not everybody uh, plays by a fair set of rules. Uh, and so I wanted to highlight organizations that are doing the work to protect our elections and to protect the, the basic tenets of our, of our democracy. Uh, a, a quote I chose was, the best response to an attack on democracy is to strengthen democracy. And that's from the Brennan Center for Justice. Uh, that's a, a think tank and a policy institute that works uh, on strengthening democracy through advocacy, research, and outreach. Uh, and so I included uh, that organization in the green tip. Um, also wanted to highlight the importance of election integrity. Uh, organizations like uh, Common Cause uh, uh, allow you to actually volunteer to, uh, to safeguard elections uh, and, and volunteer to ensure that uh, that voting processes are following the rules. Uh, similarly, When We All Vote is an organization that uh, uh, focuses on ensuring that, that everyone who can vote in fact does vote by uh, uh, registering people who are eligible and focusing on underrepresented uh, participants in the electoral process. And finally, uh, if, if the lane you wanna occupy for your uh, protection of democracy is, is being a donor, uh, organizations like Focus for Democracy are really great because they, uh, they use data-driven methods to analyze and identify programs that have the greatest impact in the fight to protect our democratic systems. They have virtual events where you can learn about uh, exactly how you uh, can maximize the return on your donations as it relates to protecting democracy. And the organization's leadership team doesn't, uh, doesn't charge any uh, fees or expenses for the work that they do in evaluating programs. So you get bang for your buck on two levels with that organization. So uh, contribute as a volunteer with one of these organizations or, uh, or as a donor or both, but, but we can't forget about the importance of protecting democracy and strengthening democracy and ensuring that, uh, that everyone's uh, following uh, the fair rules of play in our, in our political process. Thanks, Al. And um, last up, before we turn it back over to Fabrice, is Marilyn Price with her tip on joining a rally. Yeah, well, and I will imagine that many of you have done rallies. I have done lots, although with COVID, we kind of stopped for two years, but now they're back in full force. And I just encourage people to keep your eye out for uh, rallies that you can join. It's just a very public way. We all see what Greta has done with rallies and we need to do that locally here too. We just need more and more people out there uh, demonstrating through a public rally um, the, the importance of, of action now. And it's also fun. You can get the press to come. And uh, Laura, thank you for your three for uh, representing 350 here. And I was just set in on one of their webinars. And now the groups, they're even doing more to help you host your own event. I was really impressed with the webinar I attended with uh, the art that you can do and um, all kinds of links, even funding that groups can apply for to get funding to host their events. So hats off to uh, 350. I think that was, um, uh, and also I, I noticed the Women's March recently. These are all recent things have been doing the same things. So I encourage us all to uh, consider doing these public rallies. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to all community members for sharing these helpful tips. And thank you to Bridget and uh, Aunt Christine for helping edit those, uh, those uh, tips. Uh, you can uh, check out any of those tips uh, in text chat. And in coming weeks, we'll share more public collection tips, including this important call to local action. We haven't finished writing the tip, but it's an important one. Join a local climate action group. 
Uh, and for now, what we'd like to do is share the work of a wonderful local climate action group that we work with, Sustainable Marin. Uh, they are creating a new climate rapid response network that will engage local citizens to work with our city or county governments to speed up climate action in our area. So if you live in Marin and would, like, would like to join their group, you can sign up at the link in text chat. You can also ask questions to Wendy Kalins, who's here directly in text chat. Um, and if you'd like to submit a tip of your own, email us at, at the team at greenchange.net. Uh, we're running a little bit long. I'm gonna to try to wrap it up in the next 10 minutes, but I do wanna share a few important things with you uh, besides the tips. We have all these online guides that we've created with, uh, for you that uh, help you take political action. Uh, one is uh, plan your vote. Another one is help people vote. Uh, that's phone banks and canvassing and, and related voter outreach. Um, you've just uh, uh, you know, heard about the join phone or, or text banks and getting out the vote. And there's also a guide on support uh, green leaders. So check them out there at greenchange.net slash politics. Great resources, and they point to many other resources from hundreds of partners that we've vetted and that can help you out. Um, so I would like to now thank everybody who made this wonderful meetup possible. Our amazing speakers, uh, Jared Hoffman, Ellie Cohen, Stephanie Moulton Peters, Laura Nish. You guys are rock stars. Thank you. You are really inspiring us to. Uh, do the work and because you are you know walking the talk and, and at every level of our government uh, or nonprofit you're, you're making things happen um many thanks to bell and bill who approached me uh, last month and said hey fab uh, would you like a little help with this event uh, we have some ideas i said yeah we would love partners they've been amazing uh co-hosts and partners br bringing in many of the speakers that you just heard Thank you both, Bell and Bill. Uh, thank you to the team. You know, uh, Al Grummet is not only is he uh, sort of helping us strategize, uh, you know, for uh, green change, but he's also right now uh, moderating participants. Kevin Morrison's putting the spotlight on speakers. Tom Flynn is helping fundraise. Marilyn Price is always guiding us with great advice. You, and Christine and Bridget create amazing content. Sarah Turner is not here, but uh, she'll be back and she also does amazing things. Thanks to all of our partner organizations. These are the people who are gonna make things happen. Uh, and, and we're very grateful that you're, you join us all here. Uh, in closing, I'm just gonna share a few things about next steps and events coming up. Uh, first, uh, if you haven't already, check out our Green Change calendar. Uh, it is chock full of amazing events that Marilyn and Bridget curate. So if you're looking for an event to join, go to greenchange.net slash calendar and you'll find more than you could possibly attend. Um, also, we're listing in text at a whole bunch of uh, phone and text banks that are happening now from all our partners. So click on one of those if you can. And we're also going to email you all those links and all that information in follow-up emails and in our Green Change newsletter. Uh, I'd like to just say a few things about our next Green Change events. Um, we are going to welcome an amazing uh, writer and thought leader, Kim Stanley Robinson, the author of The Ministry for the Future, which is a cli-fi novel that uh, helps us think about how will we solve the climate crisis and he, he uses a science fiction uh, lens to show us how we solved it 50 years from now. Um, he's gonna talk about the importance of optimism for protecting our future, how we might actually get through our climate crisis and how each of us can take action to make that happen. And we'll have a few other speakers that will talk about innovations that could help solve our climate crisis, finding hope in challenging times, the power of community, and helping young people lead a transition to a better world. So you can sign up right now. The, the link is in text chat. It's in January 30, uh, so you got plenty of time, but we basically do these on uh, almost every quarter, but we're taking kind of a break to work on the elections. 
Uh, and then please join us for Earth Day Moran on April 23rd. It's going to be a blast. Uh, it'll be at the Mill Valley Community Center. Some of you may remember the event we hosted in April. It was just amazing, Earth 2050. We had uh, over a thousand participants of all ages, so many activities, exhibits, arts, electric vehicles, music and speakers. It's a, it's a wonderful way to meet the community in person and to exchange information, to make incredible connections that can last for years to come. Uh, if you'd like to help volunteer for this event, we're recruiting volunteers now. There's actually work to be done between now and then. So please email team at greenchange.net. You can even sign up at the link in text chat. And if you'd like to partner and exhibit, uh, we definitely want to talk with you. So that's it in a nutshell. Uh, we hope to see you at some of those events. Uh, stay in touch, join our Facebook group, uh, subscribe to our network, uh, and uh, visit greenchange.net from time to time. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll feed you information that would be useful, and uh, we really look forward to seeing you soon at our next event. Thank you for coming, and uh, uh, good luck to us all.